Hello and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Hopkins, and today I'm joined by uh, somebody I've got to interact with a couple times now. Uh, you know, Broderick, our producer, was saying, well, is this guy a big deal? And I said, yeah, he's a pretty big deal. We, we like having him around and he, you know, makes great things happen in the world. That's what we mean by big deal, moving the needle for, uh, you know, really millions and millions of people. So Scott Harrison, uh, really excited to have you on the show today. Thanks for taking time out, even though we're not in person, which was our original hope here today. But I know I was supposed to be with you this morning. I know it was going to be fun. We were looking forward to it last night. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been out to Ron's Lodge before, but uh, it's it's uh, there's that show Yellowstone, and and uh, people are always like, oh, it's like going yep, to Yellowstone, yep. and I was like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, so Scott, thanks for being here, and uh, for people who don't know you, can you give us the kind of thirty seconds of who you are, what you do, and then we will dive a little bit into your story, and as I said, maybe push you a little sure. bit on uh, financial planning stuff too, since you're like, yeah, that's not my thing, and that's more fun than to push you on it. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds good. Um, yeah, so I uh, been leading an organization called Charity Water for the last fifteen years. And we have a very simple mission to try to bring clean drinking water to every single person alive on the planet. And unfortunately, as, as we record this, you know, in the comfort of, of your studio and, and my home, uh, one out of 10 people alive are drinking dirty, contaminated, diseased water. And it's about 771 million people. Uh, you know, two Americas full of people right now drinking filthy, disgusting water. Uh, risking their lives. So that's the problem that we have been trying to solve. We think that number should be zero. We think everybody alive should have access to, to the most basic need for, for health and, and for life. And uh, we've been you know, leading this global movement to get people excited about making that possible. Um, and uh, we just turned 15 this year. We're a nonprofit based out of New York City, although now we're in a remote environment. And we work across 29 nations throughout Africa and India and Southeast Asia, um, again, on, on the water crisis, trying to, to solve this problem. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I know I've said this to you before, but it's uh, truly is a noble endeavor. And it, it always makes me kind of, I, I don't know, emotional. And I've changed the way I even think uh about water since having met you since your I, actually the first time I saw a video of you uh, talking about this and then I was at a conference that I was going to I think that day and I just remember thinking like the people were like oh well how many water bottles do you want when you're speaking and now uh, it, you know it's that yeah. notion that you're like wow like I take it for granted that I can ask for five water bottles if I need five water bottles if I want three water bottles if I want cold sure. water with ice I mean really think about it when is the last time you've been thirsty yeah. I mean, you, you run a marathon and there are people handing out water at every single step along the way, right? We don't even know what it's like to experience thirst anymore. There's actually a, there's a, I, I don't know if it was a marathon. There's like a race video too. I don't know if you've seen it, but it would probably upset you. The, the guy's like fourth and he takes his arm and knocks over all the, the uh, cups of water on the, like the marathon run table where all the other racers are coming behind him. <laughs> And it's it's kind of one of those things, right? It's kind of funny, but then, as you said, when you stop and think about it, like even in a broader perspective, right? Here's somebody who's like, first of all, being a total jerk to every runner behind him, but you know, just wasting water that's not available sure. for hundreds of millions of people. Uh, it's a it's sure. a, yeah, it's a great framing lesson for people, kind of in their daily lives here. Uh, so uh, one of the questions we always ask people to start off too is a uh, favorite thing about food. So you're obviously, a lot of this is about water and the ability to just, you know, be safe and healthy, yep. avoid disease. Um, what do you think about on the food side too? Because obviously water has a huge impact on the ability to grow food, have food, um, you know, where you're getting your nutrition from. So what, what is it that immediately comes to mind when somebody brings up food, not in the water context? <laughs> well, I love cooking. Uh, I've got a five and a seven year old and we just like to cook a lot. Uh, probably the best thing that we made recently was lasagna. And my kids just had their hands deep in ricotta and shredding mozzarella 
and uh, it was it was delicious. We had about twenty five people over um, at at our farm. Uh, we were in Pennsylvania um, over the holidays, and uh, it was it was really uh, pretty cool watching my kids, you know, cook for for a bunch of people. Uh, so that's one of the things we love together. You know, I would say in the context of our work, you know, we'll hear sometimes when we bring clean drinking water into a village that uh, women will use that extra water, that clean water that they have now available close to their home, and they will use it to grow food. They will use it to garden, uh, to grow uh, you know, healthy, natural food for their, their families. And in a previous context, without the water, when it was dirty, when it was a far distance away, you know, they, they, they didn't have that surplus that would, that would allow them to, to grow food. I mean, you know, again, I guess we're back on water, but, you know, it's one of those things that really touches almost every aspect of life. And, you know, as you mentioned, we just take that for granted. I mean, everybody listening, I'm sure, just woke up this morning and maybe you put on a pot of coffee, maybe you went to the gym and, and grabbed a, a water bottle or a reusable bottle, hopefully. Uh, you brushed your teeth with clean water, you took a shower. You know, this is just something that we, we, we really just do take for granted here in, in, in the Western world. And, uh, you know, the, the, the context is so different. You know, I've now been to 70 countries. Uh, I've been to Ethiopia 31 different times since starting Charity Water. And, you know, what I see there is a woman who will walk up, she'll wake up at, you know, four or five in the morning. She'll walk eight hours just to get the water for the day. You're not returning home until nine or 10. And then she's got to go about, you know, her, her chores and she's got to take care of the house and sometimes has to go and collect firewood. And the crazy thing is that she walked eight hours for water that wasn't even clean. It wasn't, it wasn't even productive water. So, it, I, you know, again, it's that, that's both kind of the joy and the pain of this work is you know that this is a solvable problem. But yet so many people who have the ability to solve the problem have never experienced it. Yeah, it's uh, – uh... Yeah, I mean, we'll get into that too. But the it, it is crazy to me when you bring that up, right? It's not a problem we don't know how to solve, right? Which is one of those things, right? right. That, you know, there's certain problems we attempt things, but we don't really know how to solve it. And uh, it, yep. this one isn't one of... Well, they're dis- we're, we're looking for cures to diseases, yeah. right? In labs and in test tubes. You know, water's not like that. There's not a single human being alive right now we can't get clean drinking water to. And, and if you're solution agnostic, a lot of different things work. Sometimes you can drill a well. Sometimes you can harvest the rain. Sometimes you can move clean water from one place to, to another or filter it. But it is a definitively 100% solvable problem. Not a single human out of the 771 million people do we scratch our heads and say, oh, we just couldn't help them. You know, don't have that solution. I mean, my mom died of pancreatic cancer very quickly and the doctors were mystified you know the the they they had no idea what to do about her cancer um i just had a a 50 year old friend very quickly die of of cancer again the 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 doctors the best science just mystified on how to help so you know water again that's that's kind of the the joy of working in this space is that you are working on a solvable problem but yet we haven't created the awareness we haven't created the will we haven't allocated the financial resources to, to make this happen on the planet. Well, I'll, I'll pull from that one, uh, too, there, the financial resources part. Uh, an interesting thing, you mentioned lasagna, though, too, actually, before we get there. So lasagna is actually my, my <laughs> single favorite. Uh, lasagna and cheeseburgers are my two favorite, uh, like, dishes. And uh, okay, lasagna is – my, my mom only cooked about three things. <laughs> And lasagna was one of them. She did that, and chicken divan were really the two things that she cooked, and then beef beef stroganoff nice. too. And uh, but lasagna is my favorite meal. And I I had a girlfriend one time who decided she was going to make me lasagna, and she asked my mom for a res- recipe and got it. But then she also decided to go on the internet and look up some additional ways to make it better. <laughs> and okay. I only dislike about two things food wise. Like I literally eat everything across the board. Like bugs, um, everything. And I don't like cinnamon and I don't okay. like peppermint. And so she found a rest. 
Oh my gosh, you're with my <laughs> wife. She hates mint chocolate chip yeah. ice cream, and uh, and I love it. And she found a recipe that put a lot of cinnamon in it, and she like over put cinnamon in this lasagna. And it's not weird to put cinnamon with meats, right? It actually does help a lot of barbecue and other things. We'll put some cinnamon in, okay. and she's like, "Oh, I got your mom's recipe, and she made it for my birthday." And I took the first bite and was like, "I feel so bad because." Like, I literally, it's like you put one of the two ingredients in here I don't eat. And that was my mm-hmm. birthday present with lasagna. <laughs> uh, nice. So uh, financial, uh, like, kind of wherewithal. Uh, do you remember your first money memory for yourself? Like, what what was that one? I do, I do. Um, we, uh, I, I used to sell Christmas cards as a kid in the neighborhood. And I would go door to door. It wasn't Hallmark. Um I can't remember the name of the company that used to do this, but I could make a little bit of extra money for myself uh, being an entrepreneur. Maybe I was uh, 13, 14 years old, knocking on people's doors saying, would you like to buy Christmas cards for me? You know, and it's pretty hard to say no to a 13 year old kid uh, to to sell Christmas cards. Later, um, I remember borrowing money off my dad to buy a leaf blower, one of those ones that you put on your back. And, uh, you know, then ask knocking on doors saying, would you like me to blow your leaves for, you know, 10 bucks or five bucks or I forget what I would get at the time. So I always liked the idea of, of earning my own money and, and entrepreneurship. Like no one was stopping you from working for money. And there were people who would pay you to do things, but you, you, they wouldn't come to you. You had to go to them. That's a really interesting lesson uh, too, right? Like that ability that. Yeah, if I want to do this, I got to go find them, right? Like, and I guess that's marketing yep. and sales, right? You got to go place your product. Yeah, people don't want yep. to blow their own leaves, but um, they don't come find you do that all the time. Well, was that your first big purchase that rings a bell in your mind too, that leaf blower? Or did you... Yeah, uh... yeah you know, the, the keyboard as well. I was a musician and I, I wanted a keyboard and a sequencer. Um, I, again, that was probably a mix of my dad loaning me some money or maybe splitting it with me and me coming up with, with half of it. So did you, uh, did you take that, uh, keyboard and, uh, you know, do you still have any, do you still have that keyboard one or sequencer? And then, uh, did, did you write a really cool song back then that you were like, this is, this is the one. And (laughs) then, oh, for sure. I probably had more than one. It was, in fact, it was probably called This is the One or, you know, You Are the One or something cheesy. Uh, you know, it's funny. I just bought my seven-year-old a keyboard for Christmas. And, you know, I, in, as in my recollection, you know, they've packed a hundred more features and they've dropped the price by half. <laughs> <laughs> I just got him a Casio for like $270. And I feel like it was a thousand dollars back when I was growing up. Um, I still play a little bit. We we rent a grand piano uh, at our at our home now. So um, sometimes I'll play and, you know, too late at night and my wife will yell down. <laughs> She's trying to say What's your uh, favorite type of music today? And it, and has that changed over time too? Obviously, we'll... Yeah, I, I love all music. Um, I like to listen to jazz. You know, I like to... I mean, I'm, I'm older now. I'm, I mean, I'm not that much older. I'm 46, but I probably mellowed out a little bit. You know, as a as a young kid, it was a lot of rock. It was you know electric guitars and maybe some yelling into the mic. Uh, now it's 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 much more chill. Yeah. Well, this <laughs> is the the oldest you've ever been, the youngest you'll ever be. <laughs> yeah, right. It's uh, uh, exactly the yeah. My music taste changed so much. So I I was uh, you know I played bass and drums growing up, and the funny thing is, yeah, I I don't think about the prices like that, but I think all everything like even drums probably cost the same dollar. Like it's not something that's suffered due to inflation and they kind of cost the same. I feel like they did 30 years ago when I bought a drum kit, it seemed like yep. it was 1500 bucks and you go buy one today and it's 1500 bucks. And yep. I love the metal music and I don't really listen to it much anymore. People ask me that I use Pandora, which everybody here makes fun of uh, for me. It's, they call me old with it. Uh, but uh I have a French, there's a station on there called French Cooking Music. And it's that like post-World okay. War II uh, kind of French jazz era music. And it's lovely. And I listen to that all the time, which is funny because like an 18-year-old me would be like, why are you listening to this? Go put on Slayer. And yep. <laughs> I, I don't know if yep. I've mellowed out, but it's uh, definitely changed. 
So uh, when you were blowing leaves out there, uh, what did you think uh, you wanted to aspire to be? I know at that time you weren't sitting around thinking, uh, I'm going to go solve uh, clean drinking water for every human on the planet. So what were you thinking about then? Sure. I, I wanted to be a doctor when I was growing up. I was an only child. My mom was really sick. Uh, there was a carbon monoxide gas leak in our home when I was uh, four years old. So I grew up with, uh, with a disabled mom. Uh, in a caregiver role, uh, helping to take care of her, taking her to doctors, doing the cooking, doing the cleaning, preparing her food. So I really wanted to be a medical professional to uh, one day solve her disease and condition, and then other people, you know, like it. So what took you off the the route to becoming a doctor? Yeah, well, I became a nightclub promoter instead. <laughs> I moved to New York City at at eighteen in an act of rebellion and decided that, you know, I'd, I'd been brought up in a pretty conservative Christian environment. Uh, so I, I hadn't, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't having sex, I wasn't doing drugs, I wasn't swearing. And at 18, I decided I wanted to do all those things. <laughs> and we were only a couple hours away from New York City. And I, I joined a band, I moved to the New York, New York City with this band. And, you know, uh, one thing led to another, the band broke up immediately, because we all hated each other. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of drugs in the band as well. But I, I became a nightclub promoter for the next 10 years. And I learned that you could make a lot of money by filling up clubs full of rich and beautiful and famous people. And you could charge $25 for a cocktail that cost about 50 cents to make. And uh, people would buy a lot of these things if you could create the right environment. So that was really my, my I guess, first career, 18 to 28 packing nightclubs, moving from club to club, building up a guest list, uh, building up a following. I know you, uh, when you do your presentations, you kind of show photos and things like that uh, about that time. And, you know, somewhat there, there, there was negatives of that, but it helped you on your journey. And uh, I guess, you know, what do you, what do you actually look back on that as kind of a positive that you learned that's enabled you to be better at what you do today, right? What, what was that skill set? or yeah. I think it was storytelling. I mean, to be successful in the club business, you have to create a story that your club is the best one. Uh, something is going on inside past the velvet rope that, that is unmissable. Uh, the best music, the best DJ, the best people, the best drinks, the best uh, decor or sound system. You know, you're always kind of trying to create this experience. And... You know, I think with Charity Water over the last 15 years, I'm still storytelling. I'm just saying this movement of generous, compassionate people is unlike any other movement that the world has ever seen. Uh, we are getting life's most basic need every single day. You know, n now uh, just kind of jump forward. Uh, Charity Water just raised $100 million in donations uh, in, in 2021. So we were able to get 2 million new people clean water for the first time. You know, it's over 5,000 people every single day now receive clean water because of the charity water community, uh, because of our donors now across 150 countries who have responded. So it's, it's our job now, or it's my job now, to tell uh, a million donors, both big and small, people giving millions and people giving a dollar, five dollars, kids sending in uh, lunch money, lemonade money, it's to show them the impact that they are making. It's to say your donations are actually affecting this change. Here are the pictures, here are the videos of people's lives who, who you have transformed through your generosity. Here's the source of water in a village before and here is the well that you helped drill and the clean water people are drinking now. So I think I, I you know, uh, maybe misplaced uh, storytelling for, for 10 years. Um, I would argue that's not a very interesting or redemptive story. You know, get drunk and wasted here, uh, but give generously to uh, help people flourish, help them thrive in life uh, is, a, is a much more satisfying story to be involved in telling. And uh, well, I guess we're right there now. Uh, obviously, what is it? Uh, charitywater.org, I believe, is the site. So yep. uh, anyone who's halfway through the show right now and says, you know what, I, I already feel like I need to do something and, and give back and say, go there and make a donation. Yep.
is that the yep. Yep, is that totally. the biggest holdup? Right. When you say, you know, look, we know how to solve this, whether it's moving water, whether it's filtering, whether it's digging wells, uh, it is really the holdup here that we haven't put the financial resources to it. Like if you told me you had an infinite amount yeah. of money, could you solve this? Yes. Yes. And it's not an infinite amount of money. Um, you know, it's uh, it's hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, less than uh, put it this way, we could solve the water crisis <clears throat> for less than the last stimulus package. Isn't yeah. that crazy? We could give everybody on Earth access to clean water, 10 percent of the world clean water for less than the last stimulus package. That is that is pretty wild when you put that into perspective, right? That. Yeah. And yep. uh, totally. I, right? I guess what has been the obviously you have donors from all different countries and I assume at this yeah. point you've you've had countless conversations with governments all over the world. What's been the holdup to see, you know, when you talk about Build Back Better Act, which is right in front of Congress right now when we're recording this, mm -hmm. you know, what's keeping them from saying, you know, it's a, again, a bill that's $1.8 trillion saying, hey, here's $100 billion. Has there been any progress on that, like uh, globally with countries or what's the holdup there? Um. Look, I mean, I think it's will first. It's people saying, we want to do this. We want to provide everybody access with clean water. I mean, some governments are not doing enough. We would argue they're allocating money in, in roads instead of water, you know, or in, you know, maybe sexier government infrastructure projects than water. So I think a lot of it is just getting people on the same page. Um, and then it, it is really allocating resources. I mean, I really believe that the, the Western nations, we have this ability to use some of our surplus to, to help people out. I mean, Charity Water has invested more per year in a few of these uh, nations than the entire water budget, right? I mean, the, the, you've got a country where... Uh, you know, let's say a country in, in East Africa where 96% of the people in the country are subsistence farmers. There's no tax revenue. You know, there's so little to work with uh, to, to actually build roads and build schools and build health clinics and provide people with clean water. So I really believe we have a role as, as individual philanthropists and as corporations, as, as citizens to use what we've been blessed with to, you know, to help people around the world. I mean, you know, one of the things that, that people are really surprised by, uh, you know, Americans are seen as being very generous, right? We generate a lot of money every year for philanthropy, but 96% of all American philanthropic dollars stay here in the U.S. Only 4% goes to meet needs, you know? And I think that that surprises people because sometimes it's like, oh, we're helping people over there. We're, we're not helping people here. No, actually, that's not true. 4% of the money is going, you know, to meet needs around the world. And 96% is staying here, our hospitals, our schools, our food banks. So, you know, the, the reality is the money goes really, really far over there. For $40, I can get somebody access to clean water. For $40 million, right, instead of building a, a new wing for a university, I can get a million human beings clean drinking water, a million lives. You know, that that's, you know, it's 50 Madison Square Gardens full of people, 50 staple centers full of people for, you know, for the cost of, uh, you know, of, of, a, of a nice building project in, in some of these cities. So, you know, I think, again, I've had this experience of traveling, of seeing how far the money goes. I will say also, you know, there's a sense sometimes that, oh, we just keep throwing money at problems like this and. Nothing ever gets solved. Well, that's actually not true. When I started Charity Water 15 years ago, there were a billion people on the planet without water. We're now down to 770 million, even though population has dramatically increased over 15 years. So we're making significant progress. These dollars are not going into black holes, uh, as, as you know, sometimes is, is the narrative. Uh, and, and you know, we can imagine a day when this is done, when everybody has access to clean water. 
Yeah, that whole story too, not just from uh, probably donations, and that's really interesting. I hadn't looked at that before, but I've heard it a lot of times when I talk about tax policy from the government, people say, oh, all of our money is, we're spending all this money overseas, and it's an, literally an insignificant, less than a percent of the yep. entire U.S. budget goes anywhere besides the United States. And, uh, you know, but that's the yep. narrative has been that, right? That, oh, well, if we cut all that stuff, our budget would be fine. And, when you educate somebody on, you're like, it has no actual impact on our budget deficit. So um, it, it's, it's not yeah. what's going on there. What's the what's the biggest thing you're concerned about when so you make great progress, you've gotten water to a lot of people. What's the biggest concern from here to the future? Right. Like, so if you're on that path and what it's, you know, I guess a third of the people who did not have clean drinking water 15 years ago. Right. It's come down by a third if maybe that's accelerating mm -hmm. too. So maybe in 10 years, we're at half of that. And But what's the biggest thing that you worry about that could take us off that trajectory that would set us back to a billion or back to one and a half billion? I think that we're not going fast enough or that the momentum does not continue. Um, I mean, there are, there are myriad challenges. You've got conflicts in some countries. You've got political challenges. You've got changing climates uh, in, in some of these places. Uh, aquifers are, are a real concern. You know, so when, when a lot of our local partners go build a well, they're really concerned about trying to replenish that aquifer, often building trenches around it. Deforestation is, is, is an issue because during these heavy rains, if you don't have uh, the trees, if you don't have, you know, uh, just to give you an example, in, in Ethiopia, uh, we terrace. So our partners are building basically stone walls on the sides of mountains to catch those rains and uh, stop the topsoil from, from coming down, you know, to, to, to protect that water and to keep it in the ground. So there's a lot of, there's environmental challenges, political challenges, um, sometimes conflict challenges. And again, you know, it's maybe one other interesting statistic just for people of everybody on earth without access to water, 80% of the people live in rural areas. Only 20% live in cities and towns. And most of the progress that has been made over the last 15 years has been urban or peri-urban. It has been cities and towns. So this is kind of last mile stuff now. This 80% is harder. You can't just go put in a $100 million massive infrastructure plant in a city and then connect everybody to, to it. You've got to go out to where these communities are living. And they are, they are living in rural settings. You know, This is where their land is, where their parents' and grandparents' land is. This is the land that they are farming to provide for their families. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, why don't they just move closer to the water? Because they don't own the land closer to the water. And I've often talked to people in, in these rural settings and, and they say, we don't want to go to the city. We have no house in the city. We have no land in the city. And we would wind up in a slum. And there's no clean water in the slums anyway. <laughs> you know, so we, we stay here and we walk for water. You know, we go to where it is. But this is the plot of land that our family has lived in. And this is just, this is our reality. So I think, you know, we've got some, we think about options, right? Oh, we don't like, like the politics in a state. You know, people rent a U-Haul and, and they move to another state. <laughs> or the, the mobility that we enjoy is just not shared by, you know, so much of the world. When you think about uh, water stories, and as you said, kind of being a storyteller, What's probably one of the more is interesting, and you're great with numbers and facts and br bringing them in when appropriate. What's probably the most interesting historical water story or fact you ever learned, right? Because you, you probably didn't know that when you were a nightclub promoter, and then all of a sudden you, you, you've gotten into this, you've learned about it. You know, when you think about things like, was it the Romans, right, when they were building their – like, what's a really cool history of water that you learned that kind of sticks out in your mind? And, or is there something as you, you take the moment? <laughs> I think it's more personal stories that I've yeah. experienced. You know, I lived in a village in rural Ethiopia where a 13-year-old girl had been walking for water eight hours a day along with all of her colleagues. 
And at the end of one of these days, and she, she used to uh, carry a clay pot out with her, you know, which probably weighed about seven, eight pounds. And she would strap it on her back with a rope and she would walk down this ravine. She would get her water and then she would haul the 40 pounds uh, plus the pot back. And she would just do this every single day to provide water for her family. And at the end of one of these days, uh, you know, she was like seven and a half hours into the journey. And before she got back home, she slipped and she fell and she smashed her pot and all the water just spilled out. And this, this 13 year old girl, her name was, was Leta Kiros Hailu. She hung herself from the tree that was next to the path where she had slipped and fallen. And she took that rope and she tied it around her neck and she climbed the tree and she, she jumped and, you know, the village elders found this 13 year old girl's body swinging with a noose around her neck and a broken clay pot next to the tree. And, you know, I, I remember meeting her family, meeting her friends, visiting her grave, uh, talking to the priest who, who uh, oversaw her, her funeral and walking in her footsteps to see what it would have been like every single day. And the, the despair made a lot of sense to me. You know, imagine every single day the terrible monotony of this backbreaking work that, that was actually curving her spine, damaging her spine over time. And, you know, to, to think that, you know, eight hours was just undone with a slip and a fall. She just didn't want to go back for water one more time. So I've, I've seen heartbreaking stories like that, stories of suicide, stories of women uh, getting dragged off by crocodiles and, and ripped to shreds because the only source of water was a river and they shared that river with crocodiles and all the things that they would do to create early warning systems for crocodiles and using brush and trying to create these safer areas. But, you know, watching your friend being eaten um, because she was in the water and you were a few feet behind her, you know, really, really harrowing stuff. So I, I think, you know, it's, it, again, if you'd asked me 16 years ago, you know, water and crocodiles, I mean, you know, clay pots and eight hour walks. I mean, this was just so foreign, but it is the daily reality for so many people. Maybe not to leave it there. Um, there's a, a beautiful story from um, Uganda of a woman named Helen who got clean water for the first time. And our team was in her village and, and said, you know, Helen, you've got a well now right next to your house. You used to walk a long distance. How is your life different? And this, this beautiful woman, Helen, said, she said, well, for the first time in my life, I actually feel beautiful. I feel like a beautiful woman because I can wash my face and my clothes and my body. And I'm clean now. I'm clean all the time. And we, we learned that this this mom had been making sacrifices. She would walk for the water and because there was so little water, she would, she would serve her family with that water. She would cook for them. She would keep her school uniforms clean for her kids. She would keep their bodies clean. She would keep her house clean. And she came last and she just never had enough water for herself. So, you know, again, something I would have never thought of in a, a dignity and water, beauty and water, you know, this is something we take for granted. But if you just imagine, you know, maybe when you're done listening, just remove clean water from your life and, and imagine how radically different every aspect of your life would be. And, and just imagine, you know, you were born in the 10% of the world and not the 90% uh, by, by no choice of your own. So that's what, you know, makes this, this work so compelling, I think. And, and we, we just need to go faster. Like right now, people are dying drinking dirty water. There are moms holding their children in their arms, watching them die of diarrhea, watching them die of dysentery because of the diseased water they have. Um, and, and, you know, again, like we don't know any kids dying of diarrhea. We go to the Dwayne Reed. We buy that, you know, blue stuff, the Pedialyte, right? We hydrate our kids. Well, that's the cure for diarrhea is hydration. But if it's the dirty water that dehydrated your kid in the first place, you've got just this cycle of disease and death that we see in so many places around the world. Well, 
that was a, a beautiful mix of both kind of the tragic and the inspirational changes that come from doing this work. I think you've kind of alluded to it or it's been alluded to through the stories, but uh, obviously a lot of this also falls on women in a lot of these countries. Um, you know, this, it does. And so what is the impact of bringing clean water to, to that side of the equation? Right. As you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's really time I think is the most significant thing. And, and that surprised me because you know, with, with my Western eyes, I just look at dirty water as so foreign. I mean, I can't imagine drinking from a, a green algae-filled swamp or a pond or, you know, water that is brown and viscous. Um, so when we see clean water projects, I'm always thinking like, well, the water looks clean now. It looks clear. But what we've heard from the women is that the biggest benefit is getting time back in their day. You know, imagine you're a woman and you walked eight hours a day. And, and sorry, I keep saying women. It is always the women and girls. Culturally, in the 70 countries that I visited, it is, it is the role of the women and girls to get the water. Men are farming. They're working with livestock. They're, you know, they're, they're supposed to be working on the income generation. But the burden of water always falls to the women. And it's also a seven-day-a-week gig. You know, if you don't walk, you don't get Saturdays and Sundays off from water. Or you don't drink water. You've got nothing to cook with. So imagine giving a woman 56 hours back just like that instantly in a week. And the income generation stories that we hear are so inspiring. Women will sell rice at the market. They'll sell peanuts. They'll build bricks. Uh, they, will, they will engage in commerce with eight hours back every single day, earning income for their families. Uh, they'll tell us that they're able to send more kids to school now that they don't have to walk for water because they can earn more money uh, to buy those school uniforms, for example. So I think that's been one of the things that has just surprised me is it's less a complaint about how dirty the water was. It's really, you know, the time wasted, the unproductive use of that time where they can now reclaim that time. There was a powerful study out of the United Nations that found every dollar invested in water and sanitation, water and toilets, yielded 4 to $8 in economic returns. So you put a million dollars in uh, working on water and sanitation projects, you get 4 to $8 million of benefit. And the big one was just that time reclaimed and turned to productive income. Another one is the health savings. You know, you, you don't understand how much money is spent, not actually on the medicine, for waterborne diseases, but often on the transportation costs getting to the health clinic. Uh, it could cost up to a month's wages to take a round trip taxi to a clinic. And a lot of people will, will see their kids die in their village because they don't have the transportation money. If they could actually get to the clinic, many of the drugs are subsidized. But it's the getting there that is prohibitively expensive for, for so many people. Right. Uh, that's a really uh, uh, two things that came up to my mind there. That's how the show goes. I think of random things and ask a question about that. Uh, one was the uh, like the toilet and uh, sanitation side. So uh, oddly enough, I actually went to a um, which existed at the time a toilet conference. So it was literally all about how to right preserve water and the research that was going on around that. And yep. it, the reason I went at that time there was a. Uh, I guess this was probably late 2000, early 2000s. So I don't know how we describe that anymore, but 2007-ish time frame. And there were a, a, a structure of a company, and they haven't really taken off to the extent that some people had hoped, called L3C. So they're like low-profit, limited liability companies. And so they have a charitable okay. piece, and they also can make a profit on a side of it. So things that were occurring there were like, can you create a you know, more efficient toilet system that you can sell, but it's also like you're creating credits out there that are tax exempt. So foundations can give to these entities. And there were a couple that got some success, but I don't know that the, um, you know, complex legal structures are not always the solve for issues, but um, it was at least yep. novel. But uh, I, I found that whole conference, it was downtown at the Philadelphia Convention Center. And it was literally like the 
entire convention center and I didn't know that that existed. But the funny thing is I've been on the like some plumber's newsletter now that I get to my Gmail that I've uns not unsubscribed to for 15 years. So I hear about all the new developments and <laughs> that, which is, you know, it's a, it's a weird thing, right? You go down there to learn about something and I've spent 15 years on their newsletter getting updates now. Uh, yeah. How does, how does, you know, how does the clean water initiative impact that side, right? I mean, because I think initially people probably think, oh, you know, we, we need clean water to drink. But as you talked about before, it's actually used for a lot of things, right? Um, the cleaning of the clothes, sanitation. Uh, and so what is the, you know, what's the impact on not just the consumption side from water as hydration, but on the rest of life? Yeah. I mean, water and sanitation and hygiene, really, there's a third. So in our space, we call it WASH, water, sanitation, hygiene. These are all contributors to health. The, in, in fact, you can impact health even more with, if you combine proper sanitation and hygiene, even than with water. But it all starts with water. Water allows you to wash your hands for example, right? It, it, uh, and, and the sanitation piece is really keeping that water clean often. So making sure that your hands are clean. I mean, look, I mean, this is kind of true. This is what we teach our kids, right? You go to the bathroom, you wash your hands. Or, oh my gosh, don't touch that dirty airport floor and then you know, stick your thumb in your mouth. Um, there are germs there. So there's, there's a lot of education that, that is happening uh, around the world in tandem with water projects. Uh, around sanitation and, and hygiene, you know, in India, I think has really led the way with with sanitation and, and creating these open defecation free zones, right? Where you'll have a village and no one is every single person in the village is using a toilet, is using an improved toilet. So that actually goes along with Charity Water's work in many scenarios we are building improved latrines you know we don't really market it it's not quite as sexy to get people excited about poop uh or you know or safe poop um but it is a, a key to a successful water project is making sure that that water project is not contaminated yeah i don't through through improper sanitation. i don't know i think you know and again just to you know because you're making me think of this uh you know as i talk about a woman yeah. walking for water with five gallons of water you know, that eight hour walk for that one jerry can or that one full clay pot, that's two toilet flushes in our world. You know, maybe you flushed a little early and you flush again. Well, you just flush the entire water that that somebody in the developing world would would use all day. You know, so again, we've just got this massive surplus that we're so used to, um, which is just not the experience of so many people around the world. Yeah. I, I don't know, though. I think that like a safe poop, uh, right, uh, initiative might actually get some traction, right? There's there's something about that that's uh, interesting, right? You know, there was a there was a German organization. I think they were called the German Toilet Organization, and they did outdoor installations. They they came at this through mm -hmm. dignity, you know. Uh, and I think it was like you, you know, it was like a you can't hide or or where would you hide mm -hmm. campaign. And throughout Berlin and other cities, they had these cardboard cutouts of people squatting next to a trash yeah. can, you know, next to a bus stop, you know, kind of looking for that privacy. I mean, that's something, again, you know, we can't really imagine other people ever watching us go to the bathroom, yeah. you know, or, or interrupting us, right? We, we walk in, we close a locked, you know, we close and lock a door. We're used to total privacy and dignity in that privacy. So I mean, look, we're you know we're we're covering a whole <laughs> wide range of of issues here, yeah. but you know I think I I want people to be left with a sense of hope. We are making progress on these issues, and you know we I, I was born in a middle class family in Philadelphia and have always known clean water and toilets, just because of the context, the nation, the development of the nation that I was born into. As I travel to Bangladesh or Cambodia or Malawi. The, my friends there, the people I meet there, they were not born into that context. They were born into a completely different context. And that's why, you know, we've been so excited and working so hard to uh, to use our resources, to use what we've been blessed with 
to, you know, again, the, the beauty of water is everybody thinks it's a good idea. I mean, it's an inarguable common good. It's not political. It's not religious, right? You know, you're not coming in with any agenda trying to uh, change anybody's worldview or push an ideology. You're just trying to provide the most basic need for, for life. So it's a, it's a really great thing to rally people behind. I've got two more questions and then we'll try to wrap up here. It's my only job here is to keep us on time. And uh, so one of them's a little right. bit more fun. Uh, you've mentioned the Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. So I'll try to, you know, we've been very deep on a lot of conversations. So cheese steaks, you, you, I, I need to know. I need to Yeah, know. South Street. I mean, I haven't been back in a while. The last time I was back, I definitely uh, had some cheesesteaks. I don't really remember my favorite places oh. back then, but they're probably still well, there. Well, say South Street, you've got Jim's and Ishka Bibbles. So those are probably the two that uh, I'd say on South Street. Jim's yeah. is what I remember. And uh, Okay, so the, the last one here um, is it, really about legacy. And we ask every guest this, right? Yeah. Like, what do you uh, – so Ron, uh, who you know uh, fairly well now, one of the things that we did in our coaching program for advisors, we – actually walk three people through and they write their own obituary and it sounds a little bit morbid yeah but it's all started with the end in mind like how do you want to be remembered do you want to be remembered because you worked yeah. an extra 40 hours a week than everybody else and that's what people wrote in your obituary and i don't think anybody ever says yeah that's what i want my family reading right <laughs> like and yours was probably that way too right you probably um you know if you rewrote it today you wouldn't have said wow he was the best nightclub promoter he could get people to any uh, terrible club that didn't actually have anybody in yeah. for money yeah I, th I think it's i think it's pretty simple uh i want to be known as generous and you know scott used his time and his talent and his money in the service of others that's it i'm always looking for ways to use what i've been given to bless others to help others and i would hope that my kids would would grow up uh, with that, you know, I, I care about much more about who they are, about their character, about their spirit of generosity than than whatever they do in the world. So uh, this one. And I'd like to help 100 million yeah. people at a minimum get clean water. And I'm only at 15 million. 15. So you've got 85 million to go. The uh, is uh, so generous is kind of the word that came out of there. Is that how your kids would describe yeah. you today? Well, today is a snow day, and I am not letting them watch TV. So that's not the word that they would describe today. Uh, probably, uh, you know, tyrant. <laughs> um, I can hear them in the background. Uh, I, I, I think so. I think so. I mean, I'm, you know, they're really young, so we're trying to teach the concept of generosity. You know, I'm probably a little stricter with my kids than some of their parents, uh, I grew up reading. I grew up working hard. Uh, I grew up without video games. And uh, so, you know, I think, uh, I, I don't know. You'll have, that, you'll have to ask him in a couple of years. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, being a parent's an amazing journey, too. And I, I, this whole conversation just about giving and, and charity water is, you know, so close to my heart. And I appreciate all your work and the impact and you know, the, the stories, as you said, I mean, you're an amazing storyteller and I know it's not the only thing, but it, it impacts people, right? The ability to tell stories throughout the history of humanity drives change and action. And it's a powerful tool to use to both do good and bad. But, uh, you know, when you can use it in the right yeah. context, it really can be meaningful. So I appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing your stories and you know, the impact that you're having in the world. And, you know, I hope that Carson continues to uh, be a good partner here too and continue to donate and obviously uh, your website. And I guess it's also the part where I ask people to plug all their stuff, but we did it once, we'll do it again, but charitywater.org. Yeah, sure. Where else? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we, we've actually got a, a, a link set up for Carson Group. Let me just double check that I have it right. It's, um, it's just charitywater.org slash Carson Group. And, uh, you know, a lot, lot of impact made there. We have a program called The Spring. And you could also go to thespring.com. There's an awesome video there that's been seen over 80 million times. So if you want to see some of the images uh, of, of what it looks like both to, to not have clean water and also uh, to drill wells and, and see clean water flowing, just go to thespring.com. Um, that's a great community that you can join. You know, we've got some people in, in Carson Group that will write a – a ten thousand dollar check and sponsor a whole village, you know that's that's what it takes to bring an entire community 
clean water. Um, my wife and I try to do at least one every year. Sometimes we're able to do two. And, you know, knowing that, I don't know, a, a, uh, the, the money that we give can provide 250 people clean water that can change uh, generational legacy uh, for, for a community is, is a really cool thing to do. So, yeah, charitywater.org slash Carson Group for the impact there, uh, thespring.com. And, and obviously, people can always sponsor a water project uh, on our site well, as well. This will be fun. I, uh, I'm going to make it my mission today. I'm flying back to Philadelphia. And uh, I tweet a lot. I haven't been on Twitter like all week now when I'm actually doing work. And uh, I tweet a lot when I'm flying. And uh, I, I, I will, I, I'm going to uh, rally the financial uh, Twitter community. And we're going to, we'll, we'll get that 10 grand today and sponsor one from FinTwit. So, Oh, fantastic. Yeah, That's it's awesome. a it, Twitter's been an amazing community when we do these. I think Ron is matching as he well. He is matching. So. Yeah. So there we actually go. do if we can get 10 from Twitter today, we'll actually get two wells. We'll do, so <laughs> There you go. Um and you guys are on Twitter too. I don't uh, the handles. Yep, just at Charity Water. Uh, I don't tweet much, but I'm I'm my name is Yeah, you, you're there. <laughs> you're like it exists. <laughs> Well, Scott, thank you for all your work. Thank you for your time here. Thanks for the impact that you're having in the world. I, I appreciate it. I'm sorry we couldn't be together, but uh, maybe you get more time with the family, which is a, a blessing, uh, you know, on the flip side. So snow days and everything. Thanks again. Uh, and everybody, yep. uh, you know. Thanks for having me. And a big thanks to all the support from, from Carson Group. And everybody, thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. <laughs>